All right, everybody. Uh, first, I want to start uh, saying that uh, thank you for all of you that came uh, last Wednesday, no, last Thursday night for the Robo Senior class. Um, I have seen the class and it looks good, but what I wanted to do was to shorten a little bit the beginning because uh, in any case, this is just a, a, a bonus problem for the exams. I don't want you to go to a very large lecture. So the, the first thing I want to tell you about NMR is that uh, it depends or it is based on the nuclear spin. So you need to have a nuclear spin so there's a NMR. Uh, any charged particle that is rotating uh, will generate a magnetic moment. So uh, protons in the nucleus as well, they will generate a magnetic moment. That magnetic moment is defined by this equation in which this y is what we call the gyromagnetic radius. And this i here is a quantum number that we call uh, the nuclear spin angular momentum. But we can just call it the spin of the nucleus. So different nuclear, different nuclei will have different spins. And uh, you will have this uh, uh, sheet that I'm going to put in our space, so probably you also have it from the reposition class. And in this sheet, you will probably see all the different nuclei that we can have, and it has their gyromagnetic ratios and uh, the spins. So you can see basically all the elements, the, their spins, and the gyromagnetic ratio. Uh, so Depending on the depending on the charge of the nucleus and the, the amount of protons and amount of neutrons that it has, it will depend uh, or will define the spin. For example, if I have even number of protons and even number of neutrons, then my spin will be zero. Uh, likewise, uh, if I have even uh, number of protons and odd number of neutrons, then I can have spins that are either one half or halves, like a one half, or three half, or seven halves. Like for example, uh, in the case of uh, hydrogen, hydrogen one, uh, the spin will be one half. But for example, for boron eleven, the spin will be three half. So that kind of like tells you, you know, that, that we can have half of integral numbers. And uh, when I mean integral numbers, I mean whole numbers, like one, two, and three. Uh, is your number of protons is, is odd, and the number of neutrons is even. We can have uh, half numbers or integral numbers as well. But if your number of protons is odd and your number of neutrons is odd, you can have integral numbers, just uh, one, two, and three. So for example, um, carbon-12 has even number of protons and even number of neutrons, so carbon-12 doesn't have a spin. Actually, as you well know, carbon-12 doesn't present an NMR uh, signal, and uh, that's why uh, proton NMR is uh, in certain ways so powerful, because it doesn't have any interference uh, or very few interference for, car for carbon. Uh, on the other hand, hydrogen, fluorine-19, uh, phosphorus-31, they all have spins of one half and uh, deuterium for example uh, it will have spins of one and of course the deuterium one will have one proton and one neutron so it will be odd odd you have integral numbers and uh, I don't know things like boron 11 will have spins of three halves things like cobalt 59, we have spins of uh, 5 halves. So, uh, 
in certain ways, uh, if you have odd and odd, it's very easy to predict that you will have integral numbers, or if you have even even, you have a spin of zero. But it's kind of like difficult to predict exactly what number, what spin number you're gonna have. So the easiest way is just to check it, check it out into a table that will give you exactly the spin. So you look at the isotope. For example, bottom 12 is three. You can see it in the table. And bottom 11 is three half. Um, when So if we go back to the nuclear moment, which is proportional to the gyro magnetic ratio and the spin, then one thing that you can notice is that the nuclear moment, that every single atom will have a different value for uh, the nuclear moment. And the reason for that is that every single atom or every, yeah, every single atom or nuclei uh, have a unique gyromagnetic region. And that is what allows us to have uh, uh, a specific NMR, or we can set up a specific NMR experiment for different nuclei. For example, we can set a specific NMR experiment for just seeing at carbon-13. Or we can set up a specific uh, NMR experiment for just looking at hydrogen. because the nuclear magnetic moments of all of these nuclei are different. And this is due to the combination of the gyromagnetic ratio and the spin. Well, um, the thing is that all these atoms that have a spin can have an NMR signal. So how the NMR works? Well, basically, you put your sample into a very strong magnetic field that here we're going to call B0. When you put your sample in that very strong magnetic field, what actually happens is that your spin, and let's take a simple spin here, for example, the spin of hydrogen. Your spin is going to take different orientations uh, in this field. And it can either orient in favor of the field, which will decrease its energy, if it is pointing toward the field, then uh, its energy will be lower, or it can be anti-parallel to the field, and that what it's going to do is that it's going to rise its energy. So spins that are parallel to the field, we're going to call them min negative, and in this case, in series hydrogen that has a spin of one half, then it can take these values minus one half, or if it is anti-parallel to the field, then uh, we'll, we will have positive values and uh, we'll call it one half. And this is just a convention. We uh, Scientists have uh, decided that for NMR spectroscopy, if a, uh, if a nuclear spin is parallel to the uh, nuclear, uh, to the um, uh, uh, magnetic field, then it will have negative numbers. That's it. So basically, uh, you can see that your spin now get, you can say, splitted in minus one half or minus or positive one half. So this is basically a quantum number, so the projection of this number in the z axis, the quantum number that we call ML. And uh, ML can have values of minus of i, i minus one simply until minus i. So in the case of a spin of one half, then the only ML quantum numbers that I can have are minus one half and one half. And here you, here you have them. So that is basically it. What we study in NMR spectroscopy is uh, basically the transition of nuclei that are in the minus one half spin to the nucleus that are in an excited state, in this case, a one half spin. So this is proton NMR spectroscopy. So basically, you apply a radio frequency that is equal to that energy gap, and then you make that proton or that nuclei that have an antiparallel spin 
I mean, no. Parallel spin. You apply a, re apply a radio frequency, and then you flip that uh, that nuclear spin. It can be the NMR, NMR spectroscopy can be understood in terms of this. Um, the thing about NMR spectroscopy, and as you can see here, is that uh, it depends on the population of spins in the lower level toward the population of spins in the upper level. So, and this is actually the problem with the NMR spectroscopy. Because uh, when you put a molecule, and let's, let's keep talking about hydrogen because it's a very simple uh, system. If I have hydrogen and I put uh, just simple hydrogen atoms, uh, let's say in the gas phase, into an NMR spectrometer, then there will be a field, B0, and then I will have many NMR nuclei, uh, many proton nuclei that are going to orient in favor of the field, but I have also a lot of nuclei that are going to orient anti-parallel to the field. And uh, this energy gap is about 10 to the minus 25 joules, so this amount is extremely small for a, a field of about 8 tesla, which is, you know, not uh, not completely wrong for an NMR spectrometer, then this, a field that strong will create a energy level separation with that energy gap. And if we use Boltzmann equation to calculate the population of the two states, what we will find out is that, for example, if we have 100,000 molecules or 100,000 uh, hydrogen atoms, there, basically, 50,000 atoms will be in the excited state and 50,000 001 atoms will be in the ground state. And basically what you are exciting is deep, very small population of atoms that are uh, in the ground state into the excited state. So that is why NMR spectroscopy is a very insensitive technique and actually to do an NMR experiment you require a lot of a lot of sample. Uh, this can be circumvented by increasing the magnetic field. If you increase the magnetic field, then you increase the distance between these two levels. And if you increase the distance between these two levels, then you increase the population of the lower level. But if the distance is small, thermal population will uh, allow the, um, uh, the upper level or the excited state to be almost equally populated as well. Well, this is with, for a standard nucleus with spin of one half. But what happens if you have a, a nucleus like, for example, boron 11? So in the case of boron 11, you have, um, you have a spin, a nuclear spin of three halves. And that nuclear spin of three halves, uh, when you put it in a magnetic field, it will get values of ML that are, if you remember, uh, it will have values of I, I minus 1, like that until minus I. So basically, the values of ML that are possible are 3 halves. 3 half minus 1 is 1 half, minus 1 is minus 1 half, and minus 3 halves up to minus I. So what that means is that when I put this boron 11 nuclei, uh, an ensemble of boron 11 nuclei in the NMR, then their energy levels are going to split to minus 3 half, minus 1 half, 1 half, and 3 half. And there you go. Um, so, 
nucleus or nuclei that have spins that uh, are higher than one half are called, let me write it here, nuclear. are called quadrupolar. So boron is a quadrupolar no, uh, molecule and it will have this kind of like splitting uh, when it is uh, in a strong magnetic field. So the selection rules, as you remember for hydrogen, boron, hydrogen, You can have transitions from minus one half to one half. The selection rule for transitions in NMR, it, it is that ML can be plus or minus one. So in this case, ML is one. So it, this is an allowed transition. So in this case, uh, I can have transitions from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, because that would make ML plus or minus one, and uh, if I take the NMR of gas phase boron atoms, how many peaks would I expect to see? Well, uh, I asked this in class and some people said three and some people said one. Well, although I have transitions that correspond to three transitions, those three transitions have exactly the same delta E. So although my signal will be uh, or will be, comp uh, will be due to three different transitions, those three different transitions will have the same energy so I'm in an NMR spectrum of boron 11, of boron 11 atoms flying, not boron 11 molecules but something else, a boron 11 atoms that is not coupled to anything else, then I will have a single lone signal. So that's basically it. So now, if you have all this information, then you can do, and you can make construct NMR spectrum of any molecule. So let's, uh, let's uh, do an example. 